What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei back with a new what if series, Reborn as the Ant King in MHA. MHAX Solo Leveling. Part 1. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Stuck, can't breathe, can't move properly. It feels like I'm trapped in a tiny cell. I don't remember how I got here, but I certainly don't feel at home. At least I remember my name. Alexander, or just Alex if you're feeling lazy. I was just walking around, a strange storm appearing out of nowhere wasn't all that big of a deal. But I remember hearing a lightning strike and then someone screaming from a nearby park. I ran there, the rain hadn't started yet, and I wanted to see what was happening. A person trapped under a bunch of burning trees. They must have been incredibly dry, otherwise, they wouldn't have caught fire. I quickly took out my phone and passed out before I managed to dial up anyone. I think I was trying to call the police or something before I jumped in and tried to pull him out. But I remember the distinct smell of burned flesh, I don't know if it was mine or his, but I never woke up again. At least not there. I don't even know where I am now it just feels weird. I don't like this at all. But at least I'm not dying. I've been trapped here for a while, and besides the suffocating feeling, not much is bothering me. Some might be bothered by the loneliness, but it's not that bad to me. I am quite used to living by myself and having minimal contact with others for extended periods of time. I currently work as a programmer. I found it annoying at first, but it was very lucrative, and it became extremely fun after a while. As for family, I do have parents. But I lost touch with them after moving out. They also didn't make much of an effort to contact me, so I was mostly by myself. Now that I think about it, it's not really something I regret, they were never affectionate people anyway. My childhood was quite lackluster. My dad being a junkie and my mom a hooker certainly didn't help me growing up. I got into gang life quite quickly. I started doing small stuff like delivering packages and selling substances. I decided to leave when I was 26 though. By that time I had seen my fair share of action and decided to do something with my life. Leaving the gang was quite easy too. I was already chummy with all of the members including the boss. He even helped me buy an apartment in the same city. Good guy. Of course, I did the sensible thing by saving enough money and disappearing from the state. I didn't trust them one bit. One thing you learn on the streets is to never trust people from the streets. I was no longer part of their group, so I was an outsider that knew enough secrets about them to pose a threat. I don't care if they truly wanted to do anything about me or not. But I wasn't just gonna stay there and wait for it. The boss, Vlad, giving me an apartment was just so he could keep a close eye on me. Otherwise, I can't explain why he still wanted to go drinking with me every few weeks. Still. I don't really know where I'm being kept or how I'm being restrained. So all I can do for now is wait. And I certainly waited a bit. It felt like days, or maybe years. Who knows really, not like I had a clock in my sight. By now, I kinda realized that I died. It wasn't exactly a hard to piece together puzzle. I'm still confused about this strange purgatory I find myself in. After a while, I felt a strong pull from one direction. I could hear some muffled shouts and some cries of pain. Eventually, a dim light broke through the darkness that was my cell. As soon as I could move around freely I heard a shocked scream, followed by some whimpering. It's hard to see right now. But I forced my eyes open. A red hue covered my vision, I tried looking around. I could vaguely make out shapes. Humans, dressed in doctor's clothing. Near me was also a woman, wait was I just born? What the fuck? Well, that at least explains why I couldn't see anything back there I didn't even have eyes. 
at least not developed ones. Now, I've taken drugs in the past. But this is no regular trip, I can tell you that much my vision slowly got better, further solidifying the fact that this was a bit more than a regular fever dream. The woman that was on the operation table looked beyond terrified and disgusted. I don't even know what's her deal. Why you looking at me like that bitch? That was what I wanted to say. It came out like strange high pitch cries and growls. They were by no means intimidating. But I could see her fear and disgust increase by a large margin. Now, I may not have been the most handsome of men. But I have never caused this type of reaction in a woman before. I slowly turned my head to look at my body. I could see my long arms, covered in an exoskeleton, my sharp claws. Wait, what the fuck am I looking at? This is certainly my hand. Does a baby's hand usually reach his knees at birth while standing straight? Surely not right? I mean, they are actually just as long as my feet this is a question I didn't think I'd ever be asking myself. But when exactly have I developed claws? Oh, and the exoskeleton. And if I truly did, why are the doctors not showing much shock at this? Well, some look a bit turned off by my appearance. Some even looked at me with pity but also a lot of disgust. The nurses especially, yeah. I'm getting a feeling that type of gaze will become quite common in my life. If I was the doctor I'd probably say something like looks like your child is going to be a ladies man he. It seems my giggle went to the outside too. But it certainly didn't sound cute. At least to them, I think it sounded dope. The woman spoke something in another language. Moonspeak maybe? I knew an Asian girl once, yeah. The doctors turned apprehensive at whatever she said. One of the nurses decided to wrap me up in a blanket. Using only three fingers and touching me minimally really? This place isn't very kind to newborn babies. Well, whatever. I was taken to a ward filled with crying little snoot baskets and left there. Great. POV narration. If you were to ask Vladislav, the largest gang leader of Florida, who Alexander Moore was. He'd have quite a few things to say. Alexander was by far the strangest person the gang leader had ever met in his entire life. He was beyond screwed in the head, but he was a great guy when push came to shove. He had seen Alex bash someone's skull in with a golf club, completely devoid of any remorse, and then refusing to kill a dog because he found it cute. There were times when Vlad really felt weirded out by Alex. But there were also times where he felt immensely grateful to have him at his side. One time a shootout occurred between his gang and another. He was driven into a corner and could only wait for reinforcements, while hoping the other gang wasn't going to rush his position. But there was no reinforcement to be had. As some of his people betrayed him and aided the rival gang by spreading misinformation about his location. But guess who wasn't announced that such thing was going down? Alex really stumbled upon the gunfight whilst going home from the store. He proceeded to slice someone's throat with a pocket knife, grab his gun, use his body as a shield, and kill at least 13 people. The rest were forced to retreat. Meanwhile, Alex barely got scratched a few times and looked completely fine. Later when drinking with him, Vlad managed to find out that Alex actually hoped they'd come back so he could finish things up with them. He was the only man that had no qualms about being attacked by 20 heavily armed gangsters at once. He was even hoping for it to happen. Vlad owed his life to Alex. Being saved on many more occasions. Any task that he needed to be done, no matter the difficulty, would get done 100% of the time. All he needed to do was give Alex some money. And bam, problem solved. Local politician misbehaving? Oh no, it seems he fell down the stairs and broke all his limbs in the process. He also has a concussion. It seems his head fell on a golf club. Gang trying to move into your territory? Oh, it seems someone told them all to come to a warehouse that was set on fire in an unfortunate accident. The doors were locked after they entered by accident too. You get the gist of it. Vlad could trust Alexander with just about anything. Vlad was very saddened to hear that he was retiring. His departure from the gangster lifestyle came as a surprise to just about everybody that even remotely knew him. 
They all thought he was a crazed maniac with a thirst for violence. His reputation was as such. His teammates considered him a great comrade too. He was what younger members aspired to be. Under normal circumstances, he would have been silenced. But Vlad considered Alex a brother of his. So he received a somewhat royal treatment. Even getting a free house and access to many resources. To his horror, Alex completely disappeared at some point. His home had signs of struggle, his money was all gone. And there was blood on some of the walls. Vlad quickly dispatched everyone he could to search for his dear friend. After failing to find him for a week he thought him dead. So he did the most sensible thing possible. Hunting down every single person that ever crossed Alex in the past. Anyone that might have had even the most simple reason to hate him. And tortured them all, executed them and disposed of their bodies. It left the leader feeling quite empty and confused. His friend was still gone, no trace of him was left. No one had any way of knowing just how little regard he had for this type of life. Basically, he was really great at fitting in and doing his part. Alex just considered being a gangster a casual pastime. He got into it from time to time. But, overall, he wasn't all that passionate about anything he ever did in his life. He gave up on the gang business because he got bored out of his mind after their gang ruled over the entirety of Florida. He faked his own death with ease. He was never the type to put his money in banks, so he was basically untraceable. He just moved to another state and lived leisurely. For about another year. Till he was struck by lightning on a fateful day, and ended up being reborn in this strange place. POV, Alex Baru. Okay, so I was named Baru apparently. I'll just go with it, not like I cared much for my previous name. This world is really strange, I've only been here for a week, and I've yet to meet any parent. Besides the mother at birth that is. I've also managed to piece together some stuff they were talking about. A few basic words is all I can understand for now. But it's only been a week since I was born, I have enough time to do whatever. As long as they don't decide to perform a very late term abortion on me. Mother certainly looked like she was willing to do something like that back in that ward. Oh, I feel so hurt. Such a meaningless existence, not even my own kin hold me dearly. Not really, I barely care about them. But my body is what I actually find neat right now. I didn't realize that I wanted to have a tough exoskeleton in the past. But now I can't believe I ever lived without one. I even fell out of my crib a few times to test its toughness and I barely felt anything. Well, maybe a bit dizzy. But I'm still a baby after all. I shouldn't even have enough energy to think about so much complicated stuff. And yet here I am, exploring the sharpness of my claws on my bedsheets in the middle of the night. The sound of my antics woke up the entire ward quite quickly. I tried to ignore them as much as I could. But you can bet the nurses weren't exactly pleased with my actions. I didn't even actually scratch any of them, but they still looked at me like I murdered their families. Ha, huh, this life is going to be a lot of fun. POV Baru. The MC will be called Baru from now on, it's been 3 months since my birth, and things are really annoying recently. Okay, so I was finally transferred to a special orphanage, at least a week or two after my birth. I still didn't know much about the world around me. Thankfully, that one Asian chick I was banging taught me some moon speak. I still needed to pick up some words myself. But some things were certainly different from what I remember. A word that's often used in my presence is quirk. That and a variety of insults mostly based on my seemingly insect-like appearance. They don't really hurt me. But, I didn't think I'd be reincarnated into a baby insect. It's quite nice really. And yeah, I've kind of realized my situation a bit. Reincarnating in a new place. I've seen other people with inhuman features. One of the nurses has three eyes. One of the parents that came here to pick up their child has a tail. I'd be starting to think that mutations are normal in Japan, but I never heard about this in the past. I guess it's safe to assume I'm no longer on the earth I knew. My language is slowly getting better and better. I am still incapable of speech. I think my vocal cords work a bit differently. 
But still, I guess I have time to study my body. I can't really do anything as a toddler. Like, nothing at all. At least the caretakers don't really keep a close eye on me. Which is quite concerning since this is their job. But whatever, it's better for me. My hearing is also extremely good. I can hear the television in the lounge from my room. Even with the door closed, I can hear it clearly. They are talking about heroes a lot. I guess they really like those in Japan. Not that it matters much. Although it's a bit weird to hear the grown-up caretakers cheer on as heroes save people on TV at least that's what I thought in the first few weeks. Apparently, heroes are a thing in this world. They aren't just fictional symbols of hope. Which I'd describe as quite dope. Heroes seem to have their own society, some are nice, and some are shady. At least that's what I heard from the news. They seem to be more like celebrities, some becoming what is essentially walking adverts, while other more serious heroes get completely ignored by the press. Only the stronger ones get some amount of recognition. Although I can't really remember the names of any of them. I discovered that I also have a lot more strength than a baby should have. I think it's comparable to a small child instead of a toddler. My claws are also as sharp as knives, so that's nice. But they aren't even sharp enough to scratch my exoskeleton, so I guess they will get better in time. A few features I didn't really know I had at birth my hands only have four fingers each. They all have sharp claws though, so I guess that makes up for it. My legs only have three though. They are just enough for me to keep balance. I can already walk, although I didn't do it in front of the caretakers. There's also my wings. They are similar to that of ant wings, I can hide them in my exoskeleton and take them out at will. But they are too weak to actually allow me to fly, for now, anyway. I have two long antennas on my forehead. My mouth is somewhat small, I have broad triangular mandibles with short pointy teeth. My teeth seem to be just as sharp as my claws. I can easily tear apart my own bed. And the metal bars around it are also nice for sharpening my teeth on. They are extremely annoyed every time they see the mangled metal bars around my bed. The only thing that seems to overcome their anger is the palpable fear they have when seeing the ruined steel bars. I guess I am a bit of a monster, adults don't even have the strength to do something like that. But from the stuff I heard, powerful people aren't exactly rare. Oh, another thing I've noticed. They have a habit of not feeding me a lot. It's more of an afterthought to them. Jokes on them though, I don't even feel hungry. For some reason, eating the steel around my bed feels better than whatever it is they are trying to feed me baby food is disgusting. And the people that invented it should burn. Eating steel also seems to make my exoskeleton stronger, so I can't really complain. But I should still tone it down a bit. They seem to really dislike me destroying stuff. Not that they treat me any better when I behave appropriately, so fuck them. If they don't feed me then I'll just eat everything. Besides other humans, that would be quite disgusting. I mean, I did some questionable stuff as a gangster. But cannibalism isn't exactly something I'd consider within my comfort zone. Still, I get a distinct feeling that something bad is going to happen. The caretakers seem hellbent on killing me through malnutrition. They haven't fed me in two weeks. And if I was a normal kid I'd already be dead. Or at least close to dying, I don't know much about the starvation limit of a toddler. Eating steel and other metals, doors and other stuff, seems to keep me satisfied. Although it's not quite appetizing. Still, lately, all of them are looking at me with hate. Something that makes me believe they shouldn't be working as caretakers in the first place. At least the other kids don't seem to be bothered by my presence. Some cried at first, but they're just fine now. The caretakers are talking about strange things. Taking the trash out is an expression I used a lot as a gangster, but hearing it from an orphanage owner doesn't feel quite right, maybe he's referring to the actual trash? Yeah, sure. They are definitely planning something quite nefarious. POV narration. Around two months slowly passed by. With the newly born Beru finally being able to walk without any issues. In this time, he had also not been fed once by the staff. 
and he realized that they were probably hoping he'd croak by now. Seeing him moving around seemed to annoy them greatly. Baru had always been a perceptive person. Even in his past life as Alexander, he was always aware of what others were planning. Even with his apparent issues regarding human relations. He may have always been bad at identifying friendly people. But enemies were always easy to determine for him. He learned all the telltale signs. He could easily discern a fake smile from a real one. In their eyes, he could easily see their true intention. Window to the soul or not, they always held one's true intent hidden within. Very few could hide them properly. Baru now had to slowly reorganize his own life. As a newborn, there was nothing he could do against his caretakers. Either legally or in a manner, he's more familiar with. He could only stand around and hope for the best. A child is usually protected by his parents. But this was clearly never going to happen. Mutant quirks had always been a sore topic for many, ever since they appeared. Some of the less major mutations were easily accepted by the populace. But Beru's quirk, in all of its glory, was by far one of the worst mutations one could have undergone. And it also happened at birth, not even giving his parents a chance to get attached to their child, before he became what society would describe as a hideous monster. Now, the caretakers were slowly hatching a plan to get rid of the strange child. Beru had been unnerving them ever since he had been transferred there. A few of the older staff might have been more acceptant of the mutated toddler. But there were many children in the orphanage. The more sensible people happened to be occupied during Beru's stay at the orphanage. And it so happened that the worst scum ended up having to take care of Beru. POV Beru. What a surprise. It seems that I was completely right. They were planning something shady. Well, as shady as it can get. I basically got thrown out in the mountains. Really, a nice bunch, they even left me my blanket. I made sure to remember their faces though, just for future reference. I don't plan on dying in the wilderness for no good reason. I can already walk, to some extent. I've actually been walking around for quite a bit already. Those people drop me off in the evening, and it's already night. At least I'm be able to get around, for food I can just consume whatever happens by. From plants to animals. I wonder how a wolf tastes like. Well, I guess I'll have to find out, won't I? I could hear howls all around me, I was already surrounded by a bunch of wolves. I don't know if they are hungry, or if I'm just entering their territory. But this is a bit too late to ponder that, isn't it? The first one to jump towards me was from the back, a predictable tactic, but commendable nonetheless. As a five-month-old child, I can't swing my arm with enough force to kill a wolf. But I have confidence in something else. The wolf took me down with its charge, pinning me to the ground by putting its paws on my chest and sinking its teeth into my arm. Or, trying to anyway. As the wolf closed its teeth on my arm, I could barely feel anything but I could see blood coming from its gums. My exoskeleton was already strong at birth, after consuming some steel and iron it became much harder. I believe I can absorb the proprieties of what I devour. So I wonder what I'll gain from eating a wolf. I opened my mouth and took a bite out of the wolf's hide. My mouth is far too small to take a proper chunk out of him in one go. But I have time, it seems to be quite stubborn and munching off my arm. It still hasn't managed much. Suddenly, an unnatural rush of primal rage overcame me. A powerful roar was unconsciously released from my mouth. It made the wolves retreat in the cover of the forest. Neat, so now I can howl. I still can't speak though. I think there's more to that sound than just a simple howl. I mean, why were they so enraptured in fear when they heard it? Maybe it only works on the wolves though. I mean, it's their language, kind of. Okay, so I do absorb the properties of the things I eat. My smell has improved quite a bit. Although, I don't know if I'll adopt animal characteristics. And I'm not willing to start sniffing butts and running around in circles. So I'll be watching my diet. I now have to find a place to sleep. Which isn't exactly hard. I'm already in front of a cave. Some might say that I'm quite lucky. Immediately found shelter. As soon as I started looking for it. 
I even dragged the two wolves I had managed to kill for further sustenance. I don't really want to be eating dirt. Although it probably won't be all that bad. I bet dirt would even taste better than the baby food at the orphanage. Oh well, time to hit the sack for the night. Thankfully, the ground doesn't feel all that uncomfortable due to my exoskeleton. I'll build myself a proper bed some other time. POV Beru. And there I was. Sitting on the ground as a bear chewed on my arms, trying to chew them off unsuccessfully. Some may wonder, how exactly does a 5-month-old toddler end up in this situation? Well, that cave I tried to sleep in wasn't as empty as I thought it to be, a bear decided to pay me a visit to my new home, you could say. Maybe it wasn't quite pleased that I was sleeping in its cave. It started chewing on me. I woke up the way I am now. I don't have anywhere near enough strength to kill a bear, so I'll just bear with it. Heh, I will leave this place when it eventually gets bored and goes to sleep meanwhile, I'll just ignore it completely. A bear's bite force isn't enough to break through my skin-tight armor. Eating those steel bars might have saved my life honestly. I guess I can thank my curiosity for that. If I wasn't an idiot I wouldn't have thought to bite into steel. Curiosity does have its limits, after all, you have to be a special type of idiot to willingly sink your teeth into steel. Which I did. And it saved my life already. After a few hours of being a bear's chew toy, it got bored and went to sleep. I took the chance to get away like a bandit in the night. I was too light to make any sound loud enough to wake it up too. Unfortunately, I couldn't take my packed LUNCH the wolves with me. But it's not like I'll go hungry or anything, there's plenty of food to be found in the forest. I certainly don't plan on returning to the city anytime soon. I need to at least be strong enough to protect myself, I don't need a repeat of me being helpless against my caretakers. Time skip 3 months well, quite a few things have been happening. I can now confidently fight against a wolf. Although I still can't overpower them. I am an 8 month old toddler still. Even if I am horribly mutated and about as strong physically as a 9 year old. My claws are the only reason I can even fight anything. They've only been getting sharper as the months rolled by. I can also somewhat fly now. Well, glide anyway, my wings aren't strong enough to carry me yet. I managed to eat a few birds. I was extremely lucky and even found a parrot. It probably escaped from a pet shop or something. But I can now speak a bit of human tongue. I can't really speak any difficult sentences. But words and simple sentences are quite easy. Something else that I find wicked, I now can coat my claws in poison. Naturally, I managed to find a snake to eat, I was a bit curious about the taste too. It was similar to chicken, but now I have some type of paralysis poison. I only tested it on wolves. Well, recently I found out that I'm not really talented in foraging for food. After eating some mushrooms I expertly gathered, my poison got stronger. I didn't notice it at first, but I certainly noticed that after trying to paralyze a wolf only for it to foam at the mouth and die. Now, with my foraging skills, if I had a normal stomach I'd already be dead. But that's just fine with me since I don't have a normal stomach, especially since I seem to be able to eat anything really. So, I will keep making my poison stronger, for now anyway. I seem to be able to somewhat control the intensity of it too. So it's not that bad. For now, I've started living on top of trees, climbing large trees is fun with my claws. I don't even need to apply much pressure to sink them deep into the trunk of the tree. Too bad I still can't kill a bear so easily. I mean, I think I can. But I will have to act as a chew toy again, and I don't really feel like doing that. Eating different things is fun, what's even funnier is finding out what ability they actually give me. Like the time eating a bird made my wings a bit stronger, or when I ate a mantis out of curiosity, and my claws got sharper. It also seems like I can't just keep eating the same things and hope for improvement. Only the first meal strengthens me. So I'm going to have to verify my food sources. Thankfully, there's no lack of wildlife in a mountain of this size. I only need some luck to find new things. 
Although it's hard to say what properties eating fruits gives me, it's a bit strange really for now, I haven't seen any other humans either, not that I'm trying to find them or anything. They might think I'm some kind of monster when they see me. Me speaking won't do much to calm down anyone either. I'll get stronger before heading back to the city, but meeting other humans can also be just as dangerous, so I'll have to be careful. Maybe I'm developing some trust issues, but can you really blame me after the stunt those lowlifes pulled on me? How exactly does throwing a child in the wild cross one's mind? What type of twisted cunt do you have to be? Good thing I remember their faces. I'll have them burned into my mind until I meet them again. It's not even about me anymore, I don't think people like that are safe to be left around children, it's much better if I culled them. I don't think anyone would make a great fuss about it. Oh well, back to climbing trees and gliding down, an activity I've come to enjoy greatly over the few months I've spent in this place. Maneuvering around the many trees of this expansive forest whilst slowly descending is very calming. Time skip 5 years I've been living on this mountain for 5 years and 3 months at this point. My body has developed quite well, I don't even know how but I am as strong physically as I was in my last life already. And I wasn't weak in any way. I also grew to 108 centimeters, 3.5 foot. Quite big for a 5 year old. But that just means I've been staying healthy. But staying healthy isn't that hard when you can't really get sick, I now should be strong enough to return to the city. Although, I am still a bit hesitant. At least I should be able to protect myself in dire situations. I won't be going straight for revenge either. I'll try to get back into society, living with no identity is difficult after all. Now that I can speak it should be easier. Hell, people will have to listen to me, I don't want to just live in a mountain my entire life. As for my other abilities I can now properly control the intensity of my poison perfectly. I also found a few reagents that strengthened it a bit. I can also fly, although only for around 10 minutes, it's very tiring. My claws can easily chop down trees and leave deep marks in the stone. I can barely feel any resistance when using them, and they also don't seem to get any duller. So I will be able to keep using them without having to worry. My exoskeleton got a bit stronger after I started eating the bones of other animals. Bears were also a good meal. You can bet that I took revenge on the one that chewed on me. Bear meat tastes quite good too, which I didn't really expect. I never cook anything, I don't like the idea of making a fire, what if it somehow gives away my location? And eating raw isn't damaging my health either. So what's the point? No need to bother with cooking stuff. Now, there is the problem of actually reaching a city. I don't actually know in which direction I should go. I don't think the people that brought me here went too far into the forest. But I strayed quite far from my initial drop-off point. Even when flying up, I can't see much civilization. So I'll do the most sensible thing in this situation and just pick one direction in which to run. I'll eventually reach civilization. Even if it takes a day or two. Time skip two weeks okay, so this isn't going exactly as planned. I think I took the complete opposite route from the city with the orphanage. But by the time I realized that I was already committed to it. No point in stopping when you're almost there. Was the thought that crossed my mind a week ago. But my geographical suffering and directional inaptitude finally got me near a city. All hail to being able to fly one kilometer into the sky. Thank god I managed to glide down. I didn't gain much energy left to flap my wings toward the ground after that stunt. Still, I am quite excited to talk to the first human in almost six years. I just need to figure out a way to get over the initial bad impression my appearance leaves on people. I glided down in the direction of the city, so I don't have as much to walk. I'm not going to lie, being that far away from people might have made me a bit anxious, but I'm sure I'll manage. After a bit, I managed to reach a road a few cars were whizzing past me as I walked down the side. I think a few of the drivers were speeding up when seeing me? Must be just my social anxiety built up over 6 years of lacking human interaction. I used to be pretty good in social situations. Now, I'm walking on the sidewalk, people are looking at me weirdly. 
But it's okay, I was expecting them to scream or something. This is actually quite fine. Although, some were really wary of me. Eyeing me up and stuff like that. No one tried to ask me if I was looking for my parents or anything. I guess it's hard to guess what age I am when I don't really look human in any way. I may just be a short adult. Or my mutation also makes me short. I've seen quite a few people that were mutated on the streets, some of them looked at me with pity. Which is not that bad when compared to the disgust some of the others have towards my appearance. Although, people treating me normally would be best. That's asking for quite a bit. After a bit of walking around aimlessly, looking for a police station, I managed to run into some trouble. I've always had an act for that. A few adults waving guns around, one of them was bending the doors to a bank with his bare hands. Okay? What? Are people in this world this strong? Someone probably noticed them looking suspicious and turned the security on in the building. Such sloppy work is a bit funny to watch. I should be able to take them on. It's been a while since I fought against a human too. So this should be fun. I could see a few terrified employees screaming stuff like please call a hero. Oh, or the police. Please. To me. But I don't really have a phone. So I guess I'll help them out a bit. Does this count as self-defense I wonder? Oh well. I quickly flew up and smashed into a window on the roof, entering the bank as the glass landed with me. The robbers also managed to get the reinforced doors open by now. Sorry don't have phone my voice is really raspy and weird. It sounds like a mutated parrot with a much lower pitch. I guess the robbers are using jammers to stop communications, which is a smart move. Much smarter than their entry anyway. Well, time to deal with the situation. POV Beru. I could hear screams and panic all around me as the robbers got through the bank's front door. Really, what a shitty heist. I mean, this isn't really my area of expertise. But I still took part in quite a few heists of this type. I wasn't really in the planning department, but I was one of the main actors if you will. Our gang leader would organize a heist every four months all over the entire USA. We all wore masks and had proper equipment. Some of these guys aren't even bothering one guy is really using an actual pair of stocking as a headpiece. This is actually a joyful occasion, I can finally say that I've met one of the stupidest beings alive. Now comes fighting. Something I am actually good at. Even with guns, these guys would be hard pressed to do anything to me in my past life, if I had proper equipment anyway. But now I also have a powerful exoskeleton and sharp claws. So this seems to be quite unfair to them honestly. The only weirdo here is the guy that just bent open a secured steel grate and blasted through the door with his shoulder. So, I'll be a bit more careful around him. One of the stooges decided to start firing at the roof, and he screamed for everyone to get on the ground. Or tried to anyway, I was already on him by the time he raised his arm. I can't really cut people up, it wouldn't quite count as self-defense after all. But I sure can beat them around a bit. My leg whipped around and struck his head with great momentum. I kicked him with my ankle, I also have claws on my feet after all. The kick seemed to knock him off his feet, he hit his head into the ground and passed out. But as that was happening, the others already took aim in a panic. M monster, shoot him. I think this guy is supposed to be the leader. Oh well, he reacted a bit slowly with his orders. I was already on to the next person, although the muzzle of his gun was aimed straight at my chest. By the time I saw his finger moving slightly, I already clawed at his weapon and made him drop it. But I didn't kick him away or anything, I dragged him closer to me, putting him in between me and his friends. And, just as my luck would have it. These guys aren't exactly good friends, as they all started shooting towards me in panic. Completely disregarding the fact that they might get banned for friendly fire and team kills after a while of them shooting their already dead friend, they finally remembered that they weren't turrets, they actually had feet. So two of them started moving behind me. I took that as a sign, through the corpse I was technically forced to use as a shield at the people in front of me, temporarily stopping their fire. 
Now, I could only take out one of the two people rushing to go behind me. They were coming from different sides. I chose to take out the one that was getting closer to the bank employees. I didn't want a hostage situation on my hands, those are always messy. I drop kicked him with my claws. I cut him a bit, but the situation is already escalating a bit, I don't want more people to get involved. The group was formerly of seven members. Now, two were out, one was killed. But now I am also in the open and not close enough to any of them for a quick takedown. And I don't really want to use another one as a meat shield. Even if that sounds really enticing right now they all formed a firing line, including the one that was trying to get behind me. I guess it's time to see if their lead can pierce my exoskeleton huh? Spoiler. It didn't, they started shooting at me like maniacs. Thankfully, all of the employees were taking cover. The only thing the bullets did was leave scratches on me, they also pushed me back repeatedly. The fight turned into me waiting for them to run out of bullets, so I can finally approach them. If I was a bit heavier the bullets wouldn't push me back that much, but I am a 5 year old for fuck's sake. Eventually, I could hear the familiar sound of an empty magazine. The panic ticking sound, the hurried breaths, it was all there. It was my moment to strike, I don't want to wait for them to unload a few more in me, it might put even more people in danger. I rushed at them with the greatest speed I could manage. I managed to slash one of them across the chest, my claws cut through their Kevlar like butter. I tried to hold back a little, not wanting to kill this one too. Although he will die if he loses too much blood before the medics get here. I looked at the other three, the only one without a gun was the abnormally strong one, who rushed me, swinging his fist around like he was swinging a club. His fist got larger the more he wounded up it seems. Really odd, but I guess I am an anthropomorphic ant, so I can't really complain much. I managed to dodge to the side, his punch hit the ground and raised a lot of dust, breaking the concrete floor too. Okay, I guess. This one might actually injure me. The other two also frantically searched their pockets, presumably to reload their weapons. I used one of the abilities I got from eating snakes infrared vision, I could see them through the raised dust. I picked up two pieces of rubble and threw them at the heads of the only gunners left. I may have given them a concussion each, but hey, play stupid games win stupid prizes. Now the only one left is the big boy. POV Beru. After giving the two one of bank robbers a concussion, I quickly turned off my infrared vision. Using it during the day hurt my vision a bit. Okay, now to get rid of Meathead over here. As much as I don't want to get a criminal record as a 5 year old, I really don't feel like being a punching bag until the authorities arrive. Actually, would I even be blamed for anything at all? Some record of my existence should still be left in the country, so my identity can surely be confirmed. I was planning on going to the police station to sort things out. I really don't get why I got this sidetracked. But I guess I will end up in the police station regardless, so it doesn't matter. So everything's good there. Now I just need to figure out a way to beat this guy up. Oh, what am I to do? I guess I could just outmaneuver him a bit and teach him that strength doesn't mean all that much. I mean, I'm quite sure I'll grow stronger than him eventually. I'm already abnormally strong for a child. I didn't even train all that much although, I guess living in the wilderness does count as physical training. While I was standing around thinking of a way to take out this tank, he swung his arm around a few times and parted the dust that was clouding our vision. He looked a bit surprised, I think the leader was one of the two I just took down. This guy should just be the muscle. There's always one in such a group. Still, I shouldn't underestimate him too much. Behind my raspy voice sounded itself from his back. He quickly twirled around and tried to punch me. But being only one meter tall has its advantages. As I just slipped in between his legs and swiped his ankles with my claws. The pain brought him to the ground, from there, the fight was pretty much done. I could finish it in quite a few ways. But the best one, I chose to just kick him to the ground, avoiding cutting him up too much, and axe kicking him unconscious right afterwards. Worked like a charm. 
After that, I proceeded to munch on one of their guns, whilst a concerned bank employee approached me. Hey are you alright sir? Are you also a hero? The lady was professionally dressed and quite cute. Even with my shitty Japanese, I can still tell she is a bit concerned about me. I'd 100% hit on her if I didn't risk getting her in the slammer for being a pedo. Still, I always thought Asians were cute, living in Japan won't be all that bad after all. Well, it hasn't really been a great experience till now, but hey, it can't get any worse right? I should really shut the fuck up before something actually goes wrong. I barrow 5 years old. I fucking hate this. It feels like I'm speaking through a shitty microphone that only picks up some words and distorts my voice okay, maybe I kinda like the distortion part, it does sound a bit cool. But I want to be able to speak properly at some point. She looked extremely taken aback by that statement. I don't really blame her. But the signs are there. I am 1 meter tall, speak in short sentences. Well, I guess there aren't any signs besides that, but hey, I don't care. I I see did you get lost or something? Do your parents know you're here? Well? She sure believed that instantly. What the fuck? There go my expression judging skills, straight out the window I thought she wouldn't even bother considering the possibility of me being a kid I mean. I just skillfully took out a group of bank robbers with barely any effort. And here she is, asking if I know where my parents are oh well, maybe children fighting villains is something that happens a lot here. POV narration. It was truly not something normal. A 5 year old child fighting dangerous, bloodthirsty villains was completely unheard of. The bank employee was really hoping this was all a bad dream. Everyone else was too scared to get too close to the one that had saved them. She approached the small monster hoping it was just a nice person with a mutant quirk. And she was completely right. But the bank employee was trying her best to take the child's mind away from the situation. She, and everyone present, had seen one person die during that conflict. And she hoped the one that helped them wouldn't be harmed in the future by this experience. She didn't think that the child would be so young. It almost terrified her, but at the same time, it also explained why their mutant quirked savior didn't even flinch in the face of those gunned men. He simply didn't know what they were yes, that must be it. Guns aren't common enough in Japan for a 5 year old to know what they were. It also turned out that his quirk was unbelievably strong. Overall, the situation was mostly handled before the authorities even got an emergency signal. The woman proceeded to talk a bit to the strange child. Who only responded in short sentences or single words. Her fear of his appearance was quite easily forgotten during that exchange. She also forgot how he had just almost clawed a man's heart out of his chest. But hey, moving instinctually can be blamed for that not so much for his skillful disregard of the strength quirk villain at the end. The bank employee was too tired to notice those things at that time. But the police that arrived found the situation extremely weird. POV, Beru. Now, I decided to see what the police is trying to do. For now, they took me to an interrogation room. I think it's just because they don't know where to keep me before they can find any traces of my identity. All I could help them with was my name and the name of the orphanage. I got a few pity looks after saying that, but some of them really couldn't hide the suspicion in their eyes. I guess they don't think any child would be capable of taking down a group of organized villains. But, to be honest, I've seen high school clubs with better organized and coordinated than whatever that poor excuse of a heist was. They weren't horribly powerful fighters either, no formal training and lackluster reflexes. I wonder how they will proceed after they fish out my personal information from their databases. Even if I was a discarded orphan, traces of my presence in the childcare system will remain. So it doesn't matter whether or not the idiots that threw me in the mountain tried to erase their tracks or not. Still, why is it taking these incompetent cops so long? I've been sitting here for two hours at least. I don't know how the legal system works in this world, but this is a bit much to hold a five-year-old kid in an interrogation room for no good reason well, I guess one person did die, another was also seriously injured when I tested my claws against Kevlar. 
The others were just with various minor injuries. And a few concussions, of course, I just hope I didn't give the meathead any brain damage. That would be difficult to explain in court. Wait, why would they take a child to court? I guess my mind wanders in stupid places when bored. Being alone for almost six years also got me accustomed to monologuing a lot. God, I hope I won't become a shitty monologuing criminal, I need to avoid that. Besides, I've already gotten my fair share of action in my past life. I don't need to become a gangster again. The police are sure taking their sweet time though, almost makes me want to just cut through the door and leave. They haven't put me in any restraints, so that is a good sign at least. Finally, the door opened. The officer looked embarrassed. They probably confirmed my identity, they need to salvage the situation, they didn't even take me to the doctor to see if I have any bullets in me I know I don't, but they certainly fucked this up royally. Treating a child like he's a suspect is beyond retarded on their part. Even if they had no actual way to confirm my age, the bank worker vouched for me, she was even in tears when they put me in the back of the car. The other employees consoled her in the end. Still, what a nice gal, 10 tenths wife material if I do say so myself. Too bad the age difference might be a turn off for the law, even if I don't know the system in this world, I doubt pedos are suddenly legal. Or, fuck me, maybe they are, who am I to judge? Back to shitface lawman. I could see the police officers stumbling in his words as he tried to ask me things. Hey are you feeling well son? Wow, instantly adopting a fatherly calming tone to cover up your fuck up. So police like. I don't doubt that the fact they treated me like a suspect will be left out of every single report possible. The law works like that everywhere, no matter what world or country. I find my voice came off a bit too loud, as the officer seemed to recoil a bit. Maybe he was being anxious or something? Still, his acting is a bit too weird my gut is telling me not to trust a word that comes out of his mouth from here forth. And my gut is rarely wrong. POV narration. His gut is oftentimes wrong. Somehow, he wasn't all that wrong this time, the policeman was certainly hiding something. But it wasn't something malicious, it was just a feeling of dread, a regret for having wronged the child in front of him. He was trying his best to not show uncertainty to the lost child that happened upon a robbery. The same child who had been sprayed with bullets for an entire minute and had continued fighting the villains with no hesitation at all. Even if the bullets weren't able to pierce the young boy's powerful exoskeleton, they still should have hurt the small child. Just a blunt force of them kept pushing him back repeatedly. The entire station had seen the footage at this point. And one of the responding officers felt so bad that he had asked for a leave. The officer that entered Beru's interrogation room was just there to calm down the presumably panicked boy and to bring him to the hospital. He wasn't expecting the boy to be completely calm. But then again, maybe the child simply didn't understand that it was in any form of trouble. From the records he had seen, this child disappeared a few months after his birth, something that was thoroughly investigated. The people that were responsible for it were all incarcerated. They tried to cover their own tracks, but their attempts only gave them a few more charges to their names. They were put in prison for life and vilified by the mutant quirked community, as well as every other citizen of Japan. The police did all they could to find the child, but Beru had strayed very far from where he was left off, so their efforts were all in vain. They thought him dead for a long time. His name was already all but forgotten as the people found something else to be outraged about. Now the police could finally close the case with a happy ending, although the circumstances of his survival were completely unknown. POV narration. The police immediately took little Beru to the nearest hospital they could find. And also immediately announced their finding to the people that had handled his missing person's case. They hovered around the case once more trying to find the details of what had actually happened. The time to ask Beru about it hadn't come yet, as they were afraid of any trauma the incident might bring up. For now, they had the results of the medical tests. It was astonishing, yet tragic. The chief of police was looking at the results with a grim expression. 
it seemed as if this child's quirk completely altered anything that could be considered human. They discovered that his body had fast regeneration, inhuman reflexes, and unnatural strength for its age. The needles that they were supposed to use to draw his blood couldn't even pierce his flesh, he was frighteningly durable. The medics were forced to use more powerful syringes, the type they'd usually use on adults with strengthening quirks. Baru had been cooperative the entire time, not speaking much and just allowing the people around him to do their jobs. Then came the time to test the sharpness of his claws. It was odd, the people at the scene described it as creepy, seeing a small child rip through steel and iron like they weren't even there. After a bit of pondering, the chief of police decided to make what they knew public. This was also a public case when it first started. Some of the bloody details were left out, but the strength of the child's quirk was a major turn on for the media. It immediately went viral. The fact that a child had somehow survived alone in a forest shocked everyone. Until the police detailed the strength of the child's quirk. Some snippets of the footage inside the bank were leaked to the public, specifically the moments where he was getting shot by a firing squad and barely even reacting. There were also the ones where he took down the robbers in less lethal ways. The scene was described as graphic for unexpected reasons, as the only one that ever drew blood in that fight was the child. Public opinion towards the police was raised due to these events. Although some detractors still existed. Some people said that the abomination will make for a great villain when he grew up. The chief of police would describe them as childish name callers. But the group of people disliking the child merely due to his looks seemed to only get larger as time went on. Then came the reporter. An event that was both catastrophic and gave good insight into the child's mind. POV Beru. Quite a lot of shit can happen in a few weeks. First off, I can't really take matters into my own hands with the people that threw me on that mountain. The police made sure they wouldn't be leaving their prison cells this lifetime. Getting a physical examination was okay, I got to ogle at a few good-looking nurses, the doctors were trying their best to be gentle about it too. Though I could tell not everyone was comfortable with my presence. Like that lady nurse scowling at me from across the hallway. A good phrase for this situation would be I am aware of the effect I have on women. But I can't really do full sentences, so this joke has to remain unsaid for a long time. Oh well, I'm sure I will get the chance to say it in the future, yeah and now I have to deal with this pompous cunt. He came in through the front door holding a small clipboard and a microphone, followed by a cameraman with some equipment. What? Do they think I'm some type of tourist attraction? I really want to rearrange their faces with my claws now. But I am now a clean and proper citizen, and I swear to god I will shove that mickock, calm down. He's just pointing it towards you, no big deal. Maybe the last few days being so eventful have me a bit on edge Beru. Good day, I am Ayamura Yu a reporter for yeah, yeah I don't care. I just waved at him a bit, really hoping he would just take the hint and leave me alone to relax. I just want to ask you a few questions, it won't take long. He continued, I stared at him like he was an idiot. But such emotions were hard to discern on bug eyes. So he obviously couldn't tell. First off how exactly did you survive on the mountain? Getting straight into it huh? The police likely don't know about this shitston questioning me, they have been avoiding that subject like the plague. I guess they wanted to do a psychological analysis before jumping in like that. Then here comes this guy, probably never even heard about the word subtle. But, I still decided to respond. I think I'll try to scare him a bit my teeth strong. Tear through flesh bone easy yeah, I really hate not being able to talk properly. And I was right on the money with that scare. He went white almost instantly, even taking a step back. The cameraman was only a bit creeped out, but he kept doing his job nonetheless. The interviewer didn't really recover. Saying a quick goodbye and leaving after that, the nurses also seemed a bit reluctant to approach me the rest of the week, how was I supposed to know that I was being live on air? And that I had caused a lot of people to feel both disgusted at me and sad for me. I did find out a day or two later. So it's all good yeah, 
Now I really wish I had a normal childish voice. Maybe it wouldn't have sounded as creepy, or maybe it would have been much worse. Oh well, you can't win them all. Or any of them. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.